Now we'll talk about one of the most important ideas in this introductory course in physics, our first look at a conservation law of energy. Now we have this qualifier, conservation of mechanical energy, and that's because we're limiting ourselves to conservative forces. But uh, it's still one of the, it, it carries with it the essential essence of the conservation law. Okay, so what we found before is if we had work on an object, it led to its change in kinetic energy. A conservative, um, if this was a conservative force, this also led to a change in a function, u, which we called the potential energy function, which we found by by integrating the mathematical form of the conservative force. Well, if we just um, look at two points in time, look at two points in time, some initial and final, then our change in kinetic energy is our final kinetic energy minus our initial kinetic energy, and that's equal to the negative difference of potential, our initial energy minus our final potential energy. If we combine our initial and final, we have our initial kinetic energy plus our initial potential is equal to our final kinetic plus our final potential, really some complicated math here, which is telling us that the sum of our kinetic and potential, because this is for any two points in time, the sum of our kinetic and potential energy is a constant. And that's it. <laughs> Again, one of our most profound statements um, is just saying it is really straightforward. And now it's all about using it to solve complicated problems. Okay, so it, of course, there was a lot looking at potential energies that led up to this. So to be able to use this, we have to, let's remind ourselves that, we've, that we first have to determine that only conservative forces are doing work. on the object. Then we have to define a coordinate system, which I'll abbreviate here, CS, um, and de then determine our force, which is a function of the position uh, given our coordinate system. Define, determine force functions. Once we have our force functions, we have to uh, define or choose zero of each potential energy associated with each force. At what, what, what position do we want the potential energy to be zero? Once we do that, then we can determine the potential energy functions. Once we have our potential energy functions, then it's a matter, now we go to identify two points in time, and then total kinetic and potential. And again, there, there may be uh, more than one potential energy. There can be a potential energy for each conservative force that's doing work. Total the kinetic energy and potential energies at each point, at each point, and set equal because the sum, well, set the sum of uh, all of them equal because the sum of them must be constant, assuming that only conservative forces are doing work. All right, so let's use this to solve uh, a very classic problem. We have a spring that's hanging vertically 
and we lift it some distance d to compress the spring, and we let it go. So we have a hanging spring, and we compress, and I, I, I'm going to say compress from the equilibrium of the spring, not the equilibrium where it's hanging at rest. I mean, there's some our, our standard definition of equilibrium length of the spring, where the spring exerts no force. We're going to lift it from that some amount d, uh, which compresses the spring, and then we let it go. Let go, and we want to know um, uh, how fast when it reaches the equilibrium point and we also want to find out uh, how far it falls. Now, our, our main goal here is simply to be able to practice using the conservation of energy. Okay, so, so let's get a picture here. So we have this uh, hanging spring um, vertically, and at some point there's this equilibrium where the spring exerts no force. Okay, and so then we, we're going to lift that up some amount d okay and then we're going to let it go and it sort of you know zooms past equilibrium again to some lower point where it comes to rest and i want to find how fast it's going when it comes back to equilibrium of the spring and then how far it falls okay so first we need a coordinate system so, uh, you, you know, absent any, you know, particular knowledge, I'm going to choose my zero of my coordinate system at the equilibrium point of the spring. I'm going to say uh, positive x direction is up. And so, um, in this case, then I can identify the forces on my system. And so the forces on my system are going to be the gravitational force, which, given this coordinate system, is negative mg, points in the negative x direction. I also have a spring force, and since I chose the zero of my coordinate system at the equilibrium position of the spring, my spring force is um, negative kx. Okay, And so now I want to find the... Uh, potential energies. So to do that, I need to find the zero of potential energies. And, you know, not knowing anything else, let's choose both of our, um, both of our spring um, and potential energies from gravity to be zero at x is equal to zero as well. And so we're going to say that the gravity is equal to zero at x is equal to zero, and the spring potential energy is equal to zero at x is equal to zero. Given those choices, then our gravitational potential energy is m positive mgx plus zero, and our spring potential energy is one half k x squared. Okay. So what have we done? We've we've completed uh, this so far. We've established our coordinate system, our zeros of potential energy. That gives us now our functional forms of our forces and our potential energies. Now we need to identify two points in time. Okay. So uh, let's do sort of initially. So so part one is we want to know how fast it's going when it comes back to equilibrium. Okay, so let's, our two points in time will, will be our initial, um, is when it's released, and two, and final, when it uh, comes back to x is equal to zero, our equilibrium position. Okay, so, and now let's look at all our our energies initially. So initially it's at rest, so our kinetic energy is equal to zero. Our spring potential energy, it's compressed some amount d. It's at it, it's at 
x is equal to d. So our spring potential energy is one half k d squared, and our gravitational potential energy is m g d. So final, this is where it comes back to equilibrium. So it has some kinetic energy, one half m v squared, but we've defined our potential energies to be zero at that point, and so we have then a relationship because conservation of energy says the total energies have to be the same at these two points in time, so uh, one half k d squared plus mgd, d is the distance displaced, is one half the mass times the velocity squared. If I'm solving for the, the velocity, I can do that, then the velocity is the square root of uh, k over m distance squared plus 2gd. If I think I did that right, multiply both sides by 2 over m, I get a 2 here, I get 1 over m there. Okay, and if I knew these values of, of displacement and spring constant and mass, I could then calculate what that is. All right. Next, part two, is I want to know how far it falls. So what happened? So it was up here at, at x is equal to d, and then it, it falls down to some final position, x equals uh, x equals x, some posi final position x, which I note is less than zero. I, I think that, you know, that might be important. Okay, so that I go back to my coordinate system. But then the same thing applies, initial energies. So at rest, it's the same as before. It's the same setup I had over here. Um, same. Now final is different, because final I'm looking at how far it goes down. Well, at the lowest point of its trajectory, its speed is zero, so its kinetic energy is zero. The furthest it goes is when it comes to rest, at the point it, it is about to uh, spring back up. However, it has spring potential energy, of course. That's equal to one-half k times its displacement from equilibrium, which, given my coordinate system and, and functional form and all that, is one-half k x squared. It also has gravitational potential energy, which is um, one half, which is m g x. But now the the same thing applies as before, and so I get one half k the the initial displacement squared plus m g times the displacement is equal to one half k x squared plus mg times the displacement, and now I'm looking for x, which I now have a quadratic equation for x. If I did some algebra on that, multiplied both sides by uh, two over k, combined terms, I get x squared plus uh, two mg over k x, and then minus this this thing over here, which is just a number, d squared plus 2mgd over k, all equal to zero. I have a quadratic equation in x. If I knew mg and k, well, I know g, but if I knew m, k, and d, I could plug those numbers in, and then I'd be able to, uh, I'd be able to solve for x using quadratic formula or, or however I want to do that. Okay, so... Now we're gonna. There's a um, there's a trick to the hanging spring, which we'll talk about later, uh, which is a which, which introduces some some other issues. But at the moment, we're just practicing uh, looking at conservation of energy, and as long as we follow our procedure carefully, it's pretty straightforward. Make sure only conservative forces are doing work, and after we define the coordinate system. We find our functions, define where the zeros of potential energy are, that gives us our potential energy functions, and then we add all the initial, choose two points in time, and all the initial energies equal the final energies, as long as we have uh, the kinetic and potential, which we call our mechanical energy.